With us today, we have Carrie Pascarello, an expert in study abroad and international travel. Carrie's the CEO and co-founder of Global Secure Resources Incorporated. She's a victim advocate who took her overseas experience with the State Department and turned it into a platform to help others navigate safe travel. She's written a book, Study Abroad Safety, that takes a deep dive into the important considerations you and your parents need to address once you've made the decision to study abroad. It'll help you develop the preparedness and safety training necessary to promote a successful international experience. Hey, Carrie, welcome to the podcast. I know that you have this book out. I was actually reading some of it on my Kindle earlier. I think it's going to be great for students to read, parents to read, and also anyone that is just going abroad and wanting a few tips for how to be safe and how to kind of have some increased situational awareness. So welcome to the podcast. My first question for you is, what are some of the things that students should consider when selecting a study abroad program? I would say a few things to think about are how long do you want to study abroad, a semester or a year? Think about the weather that you're going to be stepping into. Will it be a cold or will it be a really warm area? Your living situation, what type of housing? There are three main types of housing that you'll encounter. University housing like dorms, homestays, and off-campus housing like apartments. You also want to think about Are you picking a location where you can have the opportunity to quickly get to other countries? But most importantly, you have to be honest and evaluate your health and your mental health. Do you have any medical issues, diabetes, asthma, or other health concerns, or depression or eating disorder, things of that nature? Making sure you have a well thought out support plan with on the ground resources available is crucial. And as an example, I worked with a family last year and their daughter had asthma and we shared resources for keeping tabs on the air pollution in her new city. We found specialists on the ground and other resources should she have any medical needs. And while she was abroad, she had a successful experience because of the planning and the consideration that went into planning her trip. We also have worked with individuals with diabetes. Making sure that they're talking with the doctor about the timing for their medication is really important. Having a special timer is especially important for those long flights and time changes that we see when our students are going over to Europe or Africa or Asia. And then having the resources in place for any type of mental health issues. Yeah, very Um, smart. mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of things that I wouldn't have thought of, really. Yeah, it sounds like you need to not only do some research about the program, but also kind of some research about yourself and knowing what environments are going to be good for you and what environments you may want to stay away from, too. Now, is there a difference between commercial programs and school-sponsored programs? What's interesting about this question is that sometimes schools use third-party commercial programs like EF, that's the Educational First, is an international education company that specializes in language training and other travel experiences. So a lot of schools will use big corporations for help with their travel programs. And they also have the regular school-sponsored field trips. Whichever your student is going on, make sure that you're asking questions about the safety record. Ask who will be in charge, ask who the chaperones will be, and ask about the emergency protocols, what on-the-ground resources are available for emergencies, and help to find that extra added help to deal with any health issues and personal concerns. You want to ask a lot of questions. You're talking to two emergency physicians. We love to be emergently prepared for everything. Uh-huh. That's yeah. uh yeah, that's our, our <laughs> That's just, our jam. That's our 24/7, yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. <laughs> At Rachel's first week, especially during our live events, we talk about situational awareness in other areas of our program. How does this apply to travel? I'll start by saying that developing your situational awareness is a big part of safety and crime prevention. And as a simple example, travel scams are a billion dollar business. Distraction is one of the methods that criminals use. Criminals do not want people to be situationally aware. And they're looking for people who are preoccupied and unaware of what's happening around them. And oftentimes in pre-departure programs, the program leader will say it's important for students to have situational awareness, but they often fail to explain how to improve situational awareness. So we focus on teaching these skills to improve situational awareness. And to further explain situational awareness, it's the concept of being alert 
to what's happening around you. It's a proactive approach to minimizing risk by understanding your surroundings. The quicker you know your surroundings, the faster you'll be able to react in a positive way. And we teach how to improve your situational awareness with the baseline check and the two R's, risk and resource. And these exercises teach the necessary techniques to incorporate situational awareness into your daily life. And I can quickly share how to do the two R exercise if you like. Yeah, I think that would be great. Absolutely, yeah. So let's look at the two R's, risk and resource. Quickly, it goes like this. Every time you change environments or locations, ask yourself what two risks are in the area and what two resources are available to improve your safety. And for example, let's say you're in a movie theater. Start by identifying two potential risks. These might be a fire or an active shooter. Next, identify two resources to help. For example, for a fire, where are all the exits and the fire extinguishers? If it's an active shooter, are you prepared with the run, hide, fight model? Identify a place to cover, something hard like concrete or metal barrier, and a place to conceal. That's to hide. It's that easy. It takes literally less than one minute. You're finished and you're watching the movie. So this simple exercise can be done quickly, and it will help train you to be proactive with your safety and security. No matter where you are, you'll be creating your backup plans by calculating the best way to save yourself using critical thinking skills and by improving your situational awareness. These simple exercises will be instrumental in improving your safety. If a crisis occurs in your life, you'll be better prepared to deal with issues and you'll be more likely to stay calm. And, you know, I get that if you're a high school student or a college student, This does not sound like the most fun thing to think about because when you want to go abroad, the first thing you're thinking of is, man, how much fun are we going to have? But you can have so much more fun when you're prepared and when you're safe. And like you talk about in your book, if you're prepared for these things when they happen, then you already have that plan that you can follow that you've already thought about and you don't need to make it up on the fly because you've already done kind of the the homework beforehand. And even like Carrie said, doing it in the moment really only takes a minute, you know, 60 seconds or less just to look around and, you know, see who you're by, the places you want to avoid, the places that you want to go to if something happens. I mean, it, I, yeah, yeah, I think it's it a great way to, a lot, to go yeah. about it. As long as you're consistent, yeah. So speaking of kind of losing your passport and things like that, uh, what are some examples of when students are the most vulnerable when they're traveling abroad? So oftentimes... It's when they first get to their destination. They might be fatigued. There's a new location. They're getting to know new friends. And then next, if they're overloaded with luggage, if they look like a tourist, and any time when their situational awareness is down, and we know criminals often target people alone, but don't think that by staying in a group, it doesn't happen. It does. So what keeps people safer is situational awareness and intuition. That's a gut feeling. I found that when I was studying abroad, the the biggest thing that kind of put a target on our back was how loud we are, how loud specifically Americans are in the rest of the world. You can pick us out of a very large crowd. And so something that I think that people can try is just take a minute whenever you're in a new environment and kind of kind of be quiet and listen to your group when compared to the rest of the room, because you'll be surprised at how just how loud you are and how quiet, relatively speaking, everyone else is. It really does, you know, cause kind of a scene. Yeah. I think even honestly, part of, you know, something that we should be touching on is we we talk about being in these groups, right? We usually go on trips as a group, but Mm -hmm. I mean, how well do you know your group mates? I think Mm -hmm. that might be another area Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. you need to kind of scan around and and decide, you know, who you're going to trust and and really have a buddy. We always talk about in Rachel's first week, our live event, you know, have a buddy and be that designated buddy for someone else. So I think that's so important, especially when you're not at home in your natural environment, Um, really just being there and, and, you know, being present with someone and for someone. Yeah, absolutely. So true. So Carrie, in your book, you talk about risk mitigation. What do you mean by this? Now, that's a great question. I'll start off by saying risk mitigation is defined as the process of reducing risk exposure and minimizing likelihood of an incident occurring. It involves continually addressing your top risks and concerns to ensure that you're proactive, prepared, and protected. In simple terms, you're finding risks and then doing your best to avoid and reduce harm. And rather than planning to avoid risk, 
mitigation deals with minimizing harm and the steps that can be taken prior to reduce adverse and potentially long-term effects. So some simple examples, locking your dorm room so no one can just walk in unannounced, locking your door of your car so you're not carjacked, not leaving your computer on a library table, and then walking away to the bathroom thinking, I'm in the library, nobody's going to take my computer. Risk avoidance and risk reduction are two separate strategies to manage risk. Risk avoidance deals with eliminating any exposure to risk that poses a potential loss, while risk reduction and mitigation deals with reducing the likelihood and severity of possible losses. So back to these scenarios, you're not going to stop driving to prevent carjacks. You're just going to make sure that you reduce the likelihood of it by locking your car doors. And the same with the computer at the library. You're still going to go to the library, but you're going to ask a friend to watch your computer. Or if you're alone, you'll take it with you. And if you choose not to take it with you, then you'll understand the consequences. It might not be there when you get back. And every year at libraries around the world, computers go missing. It's the same scenario. And each time somebody's walking away from their computer thinking that it's safe. So I want students to really look at risk and safety from a new perspective. And one of the ways to do this is really by identifying an individual's risk appetite. And we have to remember that life is risky, but it's all about balancing that risk. And a risk appetite can be defined as the type and amount of risk that one's willing to take to accomplish their mission. Risks can be life-changing, and they're also a very important part of life and our development and our growth. So on the same page, what are some proactive strategies students can utilize to stay safe? Are there safety products a student should have with them? Let's see. I really like a few items, the doorstop, personal alarm device to draw attention and send a GPS location, the student safety assessment, a stash band. They're all in my book. I love these tools to stay safe. But a perfect example of how taking the time to strategize safety can save a life, I'll share a story about my daughter who went on a study abroad program. And before her departure, we reviewed her risk mitigation plan possible dangerous what-if scenarios, and contingency plans. And this ended up paying off because after she checked into her hotel room, there was a knock at her door. And a man said that he was maintenance and that he was there to fix her air conditioner in the room. But as discussed in our safety plans, our daughter needed to check with the front desk before opening the door to a stranger and to somebody who was unannounced. So when she called the hotel front desk, they said, I'm sorry, but we didn't send anybody to your room. Our daughter had her safety plan in place and she needed to use it almost immediately. This scenario chills me to this day. She was in 10th grade, thousands of miles away from me, but she had her safety plan and it worked. Our daughter took responsibility for her safety, which may have saved her life because we know nobody would ever knock on a door and lie about who they are and why they're there and why you should open the door unless they're a criminal. It's called the cold call technique and it happens and it's used by criminals worldwide. I often say it's better to have a plan in place and not use it than to need a plan and not have one. And this is why we need to talk and start the conversation with our students so that they can be proactive with their safety and security. I don't know. Did you ever have any safety, you know, products no, with you? No, I never did. Mostly just because we were traveling so much. I couldn't, you know, keep like a, a pocket knife or anything. Not that I think that would be very helpful. Right. But but I was always very, I was like the nervous Nelly of our group. Um, I Shocking. You know, yeah, I know. I had, <laughs> I had like, you know, my backpack in front of me and was always the one that was telling everyone to kind of hush and, yeah. and be more protective. And, uh, and I got laughed at a lot for it, but. Um, I think you, you bring up a good point though, too, right? Like you can't have a pocket knife with you necessarily when you're traveling. So I think one thing that we should touch on is maybe it'd be important to look up the laws where you're going. Sure. The things that you can have with you. Cause I mean, you know. I'm Canadian, and if we every time we try to cross the border, if I have my pepper spray, they'll take it. Wait, Canadians? Uh, they don't believe in pepper spray. I was about to say they don't believe just in salt. violence. Just uh, salt, no pepper. So it's actually just pepper. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's black uh, peppercorns. No, and also you know for people that are backpacking and and things like that, you know, the, or you know if you're just taking a backpack, for instance you're not going to be able to check a bag. And sure. so any you know weapon or anything like that, you're not going to be able to take on the plane. Yeah. So 
it's important to think about, you know, what what strategies you have to defend yourself or to kind of stay safe physically. Yeah. All right. So we've kind of touched on some of the things that you can do as a group, especially whenever you're going on these sponsored programs. But what about, you know, these outings that happen outside of the study program? Like, how can you ensure that these programs separately are vetted and well supervised? Ask questions. Ask questions about the safety record. Ask who will be in charge. Ask who the chaperones are. Also ask to see the EAP, the emergency action plan. Look for reviews. There's a whole list of questions in my book. And the way I look at study abroad and personal travel is I want my kids to have the same level of safety and security as a top CEO. I want them to have access to the safety and security strategies to keep them safe because they are the most important people in my life. Did you ever go on any outings whenever you were studying abroad, Stephen? So not really because of my the specific kind of nature of my study abroad programs, because this wasn't something that was repeated. It was kind of a one off. Mm. So it wasn't like we went to the campus in Florence or the campus in Greece. And, you know, that way you do like day trips to other places. The whole thing was really a group of maybe 16 to 20 people that all just traveled together everywhere. Yeah. So there weren't any, you know, we're just going to take a small group and go on a train across Europe. And because of that, I think it was a lot more safe because everyone was going from the same restaurant to the same building basically the entire time. Sure. I think that brings up, too, that, you know, we're we're kind of teaching you guys that maybe we should start by researching even before you hit the ground, before you get on a plane, as far as your actual study abroad program. But then, you know, even these extracurriculars that you want to do really should be vetted as well and really should be studied before you go. Absolutely. And there are going to be kind of spur of the moment ideas, but you really want to sit down and just think about the safety of it before you go off into some adventure. Even just a quick Google search, because right now there's Wi-Fi everywhere. Yeah. So just kind of looking at where you're going, what you're doing, what mode of transportation you're going. And like we we're kind of touching on before, I think, is finding a buddy, uh, someone that is really going to look out for you. Yeah. Because some of these outings, it's going to be a lot of acquaintances that might not have your best interest at heart. And you want to be safe both for you and and for the whole group. Yeah. And that's kind of what we teach even through Rachel's first week. Everybody is someone's Rachel, right? You always want to have that buddy, but you want to be that buddy. That's someone's daughter. That's someone's sister. So making sure that you're you know, there for that person and also that you have someone that's there for you. There's not going to be a lot of peer pressure to be the safe one in the group. And so it's important to be that person that is intentional because you want to kind of bring it up if others aren't. Right. It's cool to be nerdy. It is cool to be nerdy. Especially in this group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what happens if a student or anyone traveling abroad is injured or suffers some illness. You touched on earlier, if you have asthma or you have depression or anxiety, you need to know about these things about yourself. What happens if a student gets injured abroad? What are the next steps they should think about to get the care that they need? Once again, having a plan in place for mishaps is the gold standard. Making sure the medical insurance is in place, go an extra step and get MedJet in addition. That's the hospital to hospital transfer. We need to have that communication plan set for an emergency communication so that we can reach out to the embassies. And oh, this actually brings me to another really, really important aspect of travel safety. And that is, we need to have the 5505 authorization privacy form filled out. Every single parent should have their child sign this before they leave for study abroad. And this will allow parents to be able to actually talk with embassies about their children's safety and to be able to communicate directly with the embassy if your student is over 18 years of age. Without this form, you no, you're not going to be able to communicate directly with the embassy about your child. And so this is a real critical form that needs to be filled out. And I actually include that in the book as well. And I stress to parents to create your plan with your students if something happens. And, and it could be as simple as this. I said to my children, if ever something happens, I want to see your face. So one night I got a f FaceTime at about 3 a.m., when my daughter was on a study abroad program over in Spain. And I knew something was up when I saw her eyes. They had tears inside her eyes. It made me so sad. But as most of you know, 
the safety standards are different in other countries. And so my daughter was at an open uh, market and they had fish on a bed of ice and the ice was melting and the cobblestones were wet and she slipped and fell on her hand. And I thought it might have been broken. And I, I had her show me because I, as, as I said, we were on FaceTime. So I wanted to look at her hand and um, I had an idea that it probably was broken, but no problem because we had a plan in place. She was to have the student supervisor um, over at the office at her school, take her to the hospital for an x-ray. And I asked her to send me a copy of it when she got when she got it. So she did. She forwarded it to me and I sent it over to a doctor friend. And I asked, do I need to have her medevaced back to Massachusetts General Hospital for surgery? And he told me it was a simple break. And his recommendation was, don't worry, six weeks with a cast. And that's exactly what she did. And it healed perfectly. Unfortunately, it was her writing hand. So she had to have one of her classmates uh, take notes for her, but it didn't hold her back. She was able to travel and do absolutely everything she wanted. And, you know, after six weeks, she got her cast off and she was still there for a number of months after that. So this is an example of why we need to have our plans in place for these types of emergencies. We don't know when one will happen. So it's better to have these conversations up front. And this is also another really good reason why to why you might want to have that hospital to hospital coverage. And unfortunately, one father had to liquidate their 401k to fly their son home because he fell and had a traumatic brain injury. And I have another example that I can share as well, if you like. And this was uh, when I was in Asia and my son came down with scarlet fever and I had to get him to the ER really fast. So but I didn't have to panic because I had a plan in place. I knew exactly where the hospital was. I knew exactly how to get a taxi and get over there. I knew how to speak a bit of the language and I had the proper medical insurance and the credit card to get everything going as soon as I got to the hospital. And he was treated and he recovered fast. And that is how we really want things to um, go while we're overseas smoothly, but it has to have a plan attached to it. I can imagine that would be really scary to have something like that happen you know, mm -hmm. when you're not at home or especially if you're not even sure what the healthcare system is, depending mm -hmm. on where you go. And if you don't think about it and if you don't talk to uh, both your you know, study abroad liaison from the school, if you don't talk to your parents about what health insurance you have, uh, and if you don't know, you know where the embassy is or kind of what you are allowed to do, then when this happens, it can be a real source of panic. But if you do that work beforehand, yeah. You know, it can be a little bit less stressful and a little bit less panicky. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, we, we talk about, right, in medicine all the time. It's especially with a code situation or something that's big, bad, and scary, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's yelling and it's a high stress environment. So the more education you have going in and that way you can just call, fall back on your strengths and what you know because of the research that you put in before you left. Yeah, the really more, important. yeah, exactly. The more prepared you are, the more of a cool head you can be both for yourself, but also, you know, for the group, if it's someone else who's uh, injured, you can be the one that kind of knows what to do and where to go. That's right. So Carrie, we've talked about a lot of really serious topics as far as travel goes, but is there any really tip that you have as far as just basic travel that you can offer to students who either are traveling for school or maybe even just for fun? Start with a lot of what if questions. Each and every student should be researching their destination. They need to be the gatekeepers of their safety. And my quick and easy way to assess a traveler's safety is to start with these three questions. And they're all yes or no questions. So I say, first, do you know the equivalent 911 number for where you're traveling to? So let's say they're traveling to Italy. What's the emergency number there? It's 112. Second question, do you know what the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program is, aka STEP program? The third question is, have you confirmed your medical coverage and does it include an evacuation plan back home if you're admitted to the hospital abroad? And FYI, the number one reason for American citizens to be admitted to the hospital abroad, it's for simple trips and falls. So if you've answered all these questions correctly, you're well on your way to being a savvy traveler, reducing your risks and protecting your assets. So if you haven't, um, you know, haven't uh, answered these questions yet, just write them down and 
put them on your pre-travel to-do list. And my advice as a travel advocacy expert is get them done before your student takes their next trip. Remember, emergency number, step program, and insurance. And in addition, the best tip ever is to have your students start a journal of their study abroad and their travel. They will love to look back on their amazing life-changing adventure. I had all three of my kids use journals, and they still love looking back on their writings and the pictures that they put into their journals. So remember, travel is a gift that our children would cherish their whole entire lifetime. And they should be strategizing their safety so they can have an amazing, successful, life-changing experience. 